many slides. Um, I did write some, but then I thought, what am I doing? I don't usually work with slides, so I won't. Um, and I'm an archaeological educator in that kind of public archaeology group. It, it seems to be the one that's kind of, if you're working with kids, you're doing the most boring thing, it's just the same thing day in, day out, and it's all didactic. Um, just pouring the, my information that I know, because I'm a prehistorian, into the kids, but obviously I'm here to tell you it's not like that. Um, I don't know whether I class myself as a public intellectual, so that's up to you. Um, but I am definitely on this frontier of archaeology and education. So in 2013, I set up Schools Prehistory, because in uh, February of that year, the new um, primary and secondary history curriculum was published by Michael Gove. And he got one thing right, which was to put prehistory into the curriculum for the very first time ever. Um, it was originally going to go into year two, but it went into year three. And in February, I was like, that's amazing. That's great. Someone's going to do something. Because I was just freelance, just not really a anybody. And um, so I waited and I waited to hear what one of these archaeological organisations or a university or a big museum would do to support the teaching of this topic and nothing, nothing came up. Um, so in August, after six months, I finally decided to set up as school's prehistory. Um, so over the last few years it built up and this year I, I estimated I've reached about 1,500 kids um, this year that I've taught through schools and museums. Um, I also introduced myself to the Hamilton Trust, um, which is an organisation that provides lesson plans for teachers. It started out for newly qualified teachers who might need help teaching certain subjects, they would be good at others, um, but about 40% of teachers across um, England use their lessons. And I was the only non-teacher writing for them because they didn't have anybody who knew anything about prehistory. I was paired up with a um, lovely teacher called Kate. Um, she helped me with some of the pedagogy. I was basically just too ambitious in what I was asking teachers to do, and I made sure that she didn't put Celtic not work in, um, and various things like that. We had a big discussion about Celts, which I didn't win, sadly. And also, um, I worked on, uh, was approached by the British Museum, who did finally get some funding from the Department for Education um, to do the thing that was helping the primary and secondary history new curriculum, which was teaching history in 100 objects. I don't know if you've come across it, um, but all the prehistory files I wrote for them and a couple of the other ones. Um, so my, I just wanted to talk through my philosophy uh, of how I, how I actually teach with kids. I've just started my forest school um, uh, kind of qualification, and it's, I just love it. It's, I don't know if you've heard of it, but if you, maybe if you, you've had kids and they've done it at preschool or school. So um, <coughs> it is, it's about getting out in the forest, but it's not really, it's, nature is great, and they know that, but it's about um, supporting the kids to be more confident, um, to be able to take risks, to be self-reliant, um, but, and, and mainly through play. So it's uh, play-based, child-led, um, and getting them to, uh, to do some risky things like light fires. I don't know how many hundreds of children have taught to light fires over the years. It's quite dangerous, really. Um, I think that, um, obviously, there's uh, very much a sense of the child is, is not a, an empty pail to be filled, as we all know. They are already a person. They are enough. I don't need them to learn anything from me, really. Uh, I just want, I don't want them to go away with any facts. I just want them to enjoy what the, their time with me, maybe light a fire with me, literally, <laughs> and metaphorically, and hopefully get that love of particularly prehistory, but I've expanded into other periods as well. Um, and obviously there is also, um, there's the EDGE report that was published earlier this year that has suggested that, there's a, and we, we all anecdotally know it, a downturn in um, manual dexterity in children because they're not really doing much with their hands and they are mostly, well, the thumbs are okay, but everything else is not. Um, so now is the time, a brief introduction, to actually do something. I'm going to get you all to play. Uh, shall I take a breath there? <laughs> you might notice there are some baskets underneath the chairs. 
in the first six rows. So if you're the seventh row up, you're really lucky. Um, if you can find those baskets, I just want you to have a play, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about what it is that I get kids to do with these. I want, so these are some of the activities that help bring prehistory to life. So up there, you've got lighting fires. So little tiny bits of iron pyrite were found in Ertzi's pouch. Please don't them. light a fire in the door. <laughs> don't worry, they have no tinder. It's fine. So if you get a spark out of that, I'll be really impressed. But technically, we think that pyrite and flint was the main way. And of course, um, the Amesbury archer also had pyrite and flint in his burial. So this, we think, is a fire lighting kit. So have a go. You hit them to, you kind of scrape the sharp edge against the, against the pyrite. Um, what else have we got? We've got chalk. So um, I, I really got into chalk because I live in the Chilterns, which is a chalky mass, obviously. Um, and I made myself my own little um, chalk spindle whirl, which was basically found at Boddington Hillport. And then I just, it's a free resource for me because I can just go and take it out of the hill. So it's brilliant. And um, you're very welcome. I try to bring non messy things mostly, but that one is the messiest. Um, but have a go. See if you can scrape it into a shape. They made little balls as well. Near a little bit, maybe. And little axes. Um, so you can see if you can make one. Yeah, there are a few tools up there, so the four of you can have a go with that. Did you have to file an ethics report for, for the removal of chalk? No. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. Uh, what have you got in that one? Ah, so if you wouldn't mind polishing the axe for me, that would be great. <laughs> 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 Obviously, kids don't really see much of a difference, but I'm hoping over the next five years it might actually get done. Uh, so, you, if you polish this long, straight edges onto the green schist, then those are that's the first bit to get nice and uh, so that, that if you tip it up so that it's kind of at ninety degrees. Yeah, that's it. Uh, we've got some little <coughs> bones games. So you're very welcome to play knuckle bones. Now, of course, there's not really much evidence of this being played in prehistory. Um, so I do use it mainly with historic periods. Um, so do you know how to play knuckle bones? Do you know how to play? No, I don't know. Ah. So if you chuck me one, can you throw me one? So one of the games you can play is to throw it up and try and catch it on the back whoa, on the back of your hands, and then do it with two, and then three, and then four, and then five. Yeah, that counts. Yeah. Um, so have a go with that. Um, we can always pass those around. Now, Katarina, what you've got there is bone work. Now. Uh, I didn't think this was a problem, but I think there are a few kids that I come across, they don't really want to do the bone work. They think bones are disgusting. It's just animal bone, just stuff I've eaten. Um, but quite a lot of them get into it. Um, so you need to dip, okay, so you, the little shards of bone, if you dip those in water and rub them on the sandstone, then you're going to make a lovely uh, arrowhead or a button or something like that. And it's they never quite, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Um, or, you know, a needle like this, which is rather nice. And obviously there's needles for like ever, so that's good. And then, Tom, I'm going to have to ask you to help me here. Um, I've been making some string, and string is a good thing. Um, this is just raffia, but I say it's lime bass because, you know, it's very similar. Put those together. And then this is the simple way to do it. So you just need to kind of turn it over like that, twist it, twist it, twist it. Can you do it your end as well? Ooh, and that's great because Tom is doing it the opposite direction to me because he instinctively knows that's what you've got to do. Great. And you twist and twist and twist and twist. And then bend it in half and it twists up on itself when I take my finger away. And then you've got string. 
and then you can make yourself a nice pendant of outer shell or something like that to make that. Now that's the easy way to do it. Uh, and if I get a bit more time with children, I'll do it a slightly more complicated way, which is to twist it in the middle and make a loop, and then twist the way and swap them over like this, which I was doing just now in those. <laughs> the, the other talks just to calm my nerves. <laughs> and you can do this whilst, whilst just sitting. Do you want to take over? So, my thoughts with all of these activities are hands-on, obviously, that they see some kind of um, achievement, but it doesn't have to be finished. So with the bone work, they're not going to get that finished. Um, but they can start to see change. Uh, with the axe, is someone still doing that? That's lovely. With the axe, they won't see very much change at all, and that gives them a sense of how long that takes to actually do. Um, obviously with the, the thing with the fire lighting is that it can be a bit disappointing. <laughs> yeah, because it's quite a feat to get to light a fire with Peter Pyrite, it really is. Um, so what I tend to do is move on and give them a little um, ferro rod, which is very modern, <laughs> but they get the fire and that's all. And what it's nice is that it links back to the use of magnesium by Neanderthals as well. So you can kind of make that link and say, this ferro rod is iron and magnesium and a couple of other things, but Neanderthals were using magnesium probably. Um, there's a site in France, Peche de Lazé, which is 50,000 years old, where they seem to have a block of manganese that they've been using to, to make fire. So I try to always link these things back to actual places um, or actual objects and have things that they're learning to do with their hands. And it's amazing the range of dexterity that children have when they're doing these things. And that kind of, that they, they never get that. I don't think you have that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, it's, it's play. They're learning, I, I want them to just play. And play with the objects and play with the materials, it's all natural materials, um, and see what they can make out of it. And when they've had a play, and I have some handling objects as well, things that I've made or things that other people have made for me, um, and we start uh, to talk about, now that you've had a go with making something out of chalk, which is actually more difficult than you expect, why do people make these balls? Uh, this, I obviously need a slightly bigger ball. Um, and the answers are well, quite amazing. They are, they all are. They come up with all the theories that have ever been, been come up with by archaeologists and more. So again, pieces, talking objects that you pass around, um, decorations. Um, I made a little copy of the uh, um, the little Iron Age warrior from East Yorkshire. I can't remember exactly where it's from. The one I didn't put his willy on it though, because I just thought. That's um, and they're like, well, what is, what is he? What's, what was he used for? Um, is he a little god? Is he a memorial to a dead person? All sorts of things. And it's, uh, so through, by, by thinking with their hands, it kind of helps their brains come up with these ideas as well. So it's really nice. Well, I, I enjoy it anyway. Um, and what I'm trying to do is get them to think about the past in a different way, think about the people who face the same kind of issues that we do, um, they approach them maybe in different ways. Sometimes they thought very differently, sometimes have very different ideas, um, that they were clever, skilled, ingenious in what they were doing, because that often doesn't come across from the teacher. I've come across teachers who have used the Flintstones to teach prehistory. Uh, or that Raymond Briggs book, you know that one? Ugh, I hate that one, I hate it. Because it's, it's not about prehistory. Um, and obviously want everything to be based on actual archaeology. Does everyone, does anyone want to go with anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with bone work, I love the bone work. I'm really getting into that. We could open up to questions now as well, if you want to pass things. Um, can, if I just say a couple more things. Um, 
So I think for the future, uh, what I want to do is have, a, have more of a philosophical underpinning to what I do. Um, and I'm very interested in Deleuze and Guattari and their idea of rhizomatic learning and becoming. And of course, Tim Ingold with anthropology and as education as well, with that doing undergoing and not being a teacher. I try and do that. I've always been aware of constructivism um, and the, the idea that a child is not a black slate, obviously. But I think I'd like to take it further than <coughs> that to actually do stuff with kids, do um, experiments through the forest school idea to bring an archaeology school where we're outside, we're playing, we're doing real things, um, kind of like a commission model that um, Dorothy Heathcote came up with, where they they actually find out something novel, something original, and can contribute to the, the wider knowledge of the, of the archaeology community, archaeological community. Um, so that's where I'd, I'd like to take it, but that means a much more in-depth relationship with kids for a, for a longer time, and probably some funding. So. That's me.